morning and welcome to the Oshkosh Area School District Board of Education regular meeting for Wednesday, June 12th, 2019. Has this meeting been properly noticed? Yes, it has. Would you please call the roll? Carlin? Here. Evan? Here. Turner? Here. Herzog? Here. Olmstead? Here. Special? Here. Kalaji? Here. We have a clock. <clears throat> Thank you very much. As is our practice, we like to have students at each of our meetings and tonight we have a very special group of students who have represented this community themselves, their families, and Oshkosh North High School in an extremely um, exemplary manner over the, the past season of girls softball at Oshkosh North High School. So we have a large contingent here tonight <laughs> from that state championship team, which is just thrilling. And uh, is this the practice? We always announce the names of those who are leading us in the pledge. So today we have Courtney Day, Molly Bittner, Emma Phillips, Emma Lieb, Mackenzie Lang, Sid Supley, Libby Nevue, Sophie Abercamp, and Erica Lenz. So if you ladies would stand up and lead us in the pledge, we would be thrilled. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You are here along with your head coach, Ken Dishler, and your uh, assistant coach, Mr. Wagner. That's correct. So um, this has been an exemplary season, but it didn't start at the beginning of this school year. It began, from what I understand, probably 10 years ago for some of you as you took up a bat and ball for the first time and found a softball field that you liked and experienced success and continued that. Um, last year, we had the honor of uh, having the North High boys basketball team join us after they had won their gold ball in Madison. And uh, we wanted to make sure that we honored the young ladies of Oshkosh North for bringing home the first softball title in school history. And so um, we are just delighted you're here. You have been such exemplary ambassadors of your families, yourselves, your school, Oshkosh North Spartans, and of course of this entire community. And uh, we are all so proud of you and uh, all you've accomplished these many years and the role modeling that you have established for girls to come after you. Last year we also had the honor with the North Boys basketball team of recognizing the Gatorade Basketball Player of the Year for the men, the, or the boys. And this year we also are welcoming the Gatorade Softball Player of the Year uh, for Oshkosh North High School, and actually this is her third consecutive nope. win. So <laughs> we celebrate <laughs> that accomplishment as well as that of you as a team. Um, I just can't say enough about your teamwork and um, how thrilling it has been for me personally to attend many of your games over your last uh, three to four years at Oshkosh North. And of course, none of this would be possible without the people in the back row. Uh, the parents who have <laughs> supported you from from little on. So, there's if any one of you would like to uh, share a few thoughts about what this team has meant to you and what this has meant to your school, we'd be glad to hear. <laughs> They're all looking at <laughs> <in> the <laughs> name. Like, yeah. Not to put any pressure on anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it, champ. <laughs> Sure, you can. Huh? Yes. yes, right here. There are microphones there to make sure everybody in the, the free world hears what you have to say. <laughs> <laughs> and this is being taped, by the way, so you can know. Uh, <laughs> so so no pressure. Yeah. It's live, too. Okay. And, pressure. and it's live. <laughs> um, this team means a lot to me because they're my sisters, and um, we've been playing together for so long. So this playing with your sisters means so much. 
Yeah. I, I totally agree with everything she said. I mean, it's really special because of a lot of us that like, grew up with each other and we grew up playing and just really like creating those friendships then. And it's like what you said, it wasn't just, we didn't start working for this goal just this last year. We've really been working for it like majority of our lives. And just to kind of see it all, like all of our dreams come into reality. I mean, we still feel like we're on cloud nine that we'll always be able to come back here and say we were the first. But really it's not even just, you know, our team. We felt like we did this for our high school, our city. So it's really special to be able to share that with not only us 14, but every single one of you guys. So thank you for having us. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Did you want to share anything? <laughs> 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 Not a lot. Uh, um, the girls say it all, and they did it all on the field. I was just very blessed to hear a great group of young, wonderful young ladies, and all the credit goes to them. They've, they've worked hard, um, went through a lot last year, came together, shared the love this year and resulted in a state championship when we couldn't be more proud to represent the school district and the school and the community. Awesome. Thank you so much. So I have a question. Uh -oh. Sports teams and athletes in general sometimes tend to be a little superstitious. Did you have any rituals or anything you had to do before the games? To we all had stems, so we all changed What were they? Did you put on the line? Not change your own pants. Okay. <laughs> I know that um, when we were warming up for the game of practice, everybody had to have their specific apartment, and you couldn't change it because obviously everybody <laughs> yeah. could go on Yeah. <laughs> so, I know that. Some girls wore their hair the same every game. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I eat fruit smell of winning. The freezer works for that. Putting them in the deep freezer yeah, for a night. Yeah. yeah, I did it with the football gloves all the time. Yeah, I learned that. Yep. So how many of you are seniors? Oh. 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 Wow. Seven of us. Seven is half the team. Half. Wow. But we also wear a black jersey for just about every game. So we had a lot of the moms had to do a lot of washing, so we're thankful for that because we couldn't change it. So. Right. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. So awesome. Very good. Well, we certainly wish the seniors well in yeah. your <coughs> college career and where, wherever life will take you and hope that you'll continue to call Oshkosh home and come back and visit and support the, the future softball North players uh, moving forward. So again, Thank you to all of you for the exemplary season and the exemplary, exemplary role models you, you are. We surely appreciate everything you have done for your school and our community. Again, thank you so much. Okay. cream often calls you after a <laughs> success, so if ice cream is calling you and you need to leave, we, we truly understand. So again, thank you for coming and leading us in the pledge and for everything you've done for our community and your school.
Thank you. Thanks, guys. Okay, moving on. This is going to be a tough act to follow. Yeah. Um, oh, the board president's report is next. You. <laughs> Uh, since our last meeting, I had the opportunity to attend the Wisconsin Association of School Boards Board of Directors meeting over the weekend, and uh, I was asked to share a couple of things with you. One is uh, Wisconsin Association of School Boards is hosting an equity symposium and summer leadership institute in Appleton on July 12th and 13th. I just happen to have flyers with me, so if any of you uh, are interested and would like to attend, uh, this would be a great opportunity uh, to explore those those two topic areas. Um, it's rare that WASB comes this close to our region, so this is a, a, a chance for us to go to something together and not too far away. I also wanted to share with you an update uh, that I received at that board meeting on uh, what's going on in the state legislature relative to K-12 education in this current budget year. Uh, this is subject to change, but this, this was accurate as of last Friday. Uh, the Joint Finance Committee is consider considering an increase of $200 per pupil in spendable school district revenues in the first year of the two-year biennium and an additional $204 per pupil allowed in the second year. Further, they are looking at low revenues, uh, the re low revenue ceiling to increase to $9,700 per pupil in the first year and to $10,000 per pupil in the second year. This is again an item that would affect Oshkosh because we tend to be one of the lower spending districts in the state. They are also looking at funding for special education categorical aid to be increased by $15.5 million in the first year and by $81.3 million in the second, which is estimated to bring the state reimbursement rates to 26% percent in the first year and 30 percent in the second year. Currently the state reimburses special education at the rate of 25.3 percent. Categorical aid funding for school mental health services is to be increased by three million dollars per year and funding for school-based mental health services collaborative grants would be increased by three and a quarter million dollars per year. All of those would have a significant impact on Oshkosh and on our uh, budget going into the 19, excuse me, the 2019-2020 school year. But um, I know that CESA 6 is sponsoring a legislative breakfast this Friday and that several of us are planning to attend that so we may get an update on where the state budget uh, is at that time. So with that, I will turn it over to the superintendent for her good news report and her calendar. Thank you very much, Dr. Herzog. Sure. So we're going to start today over at Merrill, uh, Merrill Elementary School, the Oshkosh Area School District's Lighted Schoolhouse Community Learning Center at Merrill Elementary School recently participated in a unique musical learning experience with the Elks Lodge. The Elks Lodge purchased musical instruments for the students, and with the help of the music teachers, the students learned going on a bear hunt. During the activity, the Elks Lodge also provided students and their families with a broasted chicken dinner. Is that going on a bear hunt? Is that one playing on your episode? I don't think I know that one. Oh, okay. <laughs> Jefferson Elementary School fifth graders recently took part in a friendly game of kickball with the Oshkosh Police Department. The annual event provides a great opportunity for students to connect and have fun with local officers. The Empower Academy of Oshkosh West High School recently brought U.S. history to life. The students hosted a Night at the Museum event by using interactive exhibits, shared various pieces of U.S. history with both parents and friends. The Alps Charter School students and staff enjoyed a visit to Washington, D.C. this past May. The trip was a jam-packed touring adventure as they observed, studied, and experienced the many sights in Washington, D.C. Congratulations to three South Park Middle School students who were recognized for entering the Rotary Essay Contest and received monetary prizes at a downtown Rotary luncheon. During the event, a small group of orchestra students also provided entertainment. 
our district recently came together to celebrate the fifth annual CARE Days. And CARE means celebrating abilities and rallying everyone. The event featured a track meet and carnival to bring together and celebrate students of all abilities from the OASD schools. Students in the district's K-12 adaptive physical education programs paired up with high school students from Oshkosh North and Oshkosh West to compete in track and field events, play carnival games and activities, and most importantly, build new relationships. Care Days is the largest inclusive event within the CESA 6 region. Wow. Congratulations to over 75 middle school girls who recently participated in the third annual Girls Go Forward program. This six weeks program provided a wide variety of educational, social, and emotional learning experiences for students. The Oshkosh community was recently able to take part in the annual Oshkosh North Art High excuse me, Oshkosh North Art Night Reception, which featured the incredible work of student artists, musical entertainment, and student art demonstrations, as well as delicious desserts made by the culinary arts students were also featured during the event. South Park Middle School students enrolled in the school's leadership class recently entered the DPI's Whipping Up Wellness Contest. The food dishes needed to include a red vegetable and be able to be replicated for a school lunch program. Three of South Park's dishes were selected to be featured in the Whipping Up Wellness Cookbook that will be sent to schools across Wisconsin. Nice. Additionally, one South Park student team was invited to prepare their dish for a panel of judges. The students impressed the judges with their culinary skills, teamwork, and composure. Congratulations to those students. Oshkosh North and Oshkosh West High School technical education students recently unveiled their newest designs of working fire pits and grills as part of the Project Grill program. Team members from the Oshkosh Corporation worked with Oshkosh West students, while team members from the Mutes of Metal Products worked with Oshkosh North High School students. The program and educational partnerships provide students with skills such as design, budgeting, welding, and assembly during the building of the grills. After learning about social issues through book clubs and liter literary essays, fourth graders at Oakwood Elementary created podcasts. Students took their desire for change and created individual three-minute rant podcasts. <laughs> Each podcast includes a call for action and reasons and evidence to support their claim. <clears throat> Forty students recently graduated from the Oshkosh Chamber of Commerce Leadership Program, including two members of our own executive team. I, along with Matt Kimmer, Director of Pupil Services, enjoyed the opportunity to get to know and to give back to the Oshkosh community. Leadership Oshkosh brings together a diverse group of individuals who, at the end of the program, are better equipped to make key decisions affecting their own organizations, the community, and themselves. Congratulations to members of the Oshkosh West track team on their recent success at state. <laughs> the 4x100 boys relay team took fourth place while the girls relay team took fourth place in the 4x100 and third place in the 4x200, setting a new school nice. record. And I personally know of one particular board member who goes <laughs> incredibly proud so given proud. that their children or child participated it. Thank you. <laughs> we are, as you know, we're all committed to building community through education. And as superintendent, I am committed to being present and engaged in our schools throughout Oshkosh. On the screen, you will see just a few examples of where I've been spending my time for the past couple of weeks. A busy schedule. <laughs> <laughs> busy schedule. With that, I would like to turn it back over to you, Dr. Herzog. Thank you very much. I know that uh, Mrs. Salaji has an education committee report. Yes. Is there anyone else who is going to be following her up with? I have facilities and finance. Okay, facilities and finance. And administrative. There's reports all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of reports. Lots of reports. Awesome. Settle in. <laughs> <laughs> but before we get into uh, reports by committee members, do we have any um, 
any other district administrators who have supplemental reports beyond the written report we received? Not at this time. Okay, then moving on, let's start with Mrs. Salaji. All right. Well, most of us were there, but to make sure everyone at home knows what we discussed, I'm going to give a report on the Education Committee. We met um, last Thursday. And let's see. First part of the presentation was Dr. Kim Brown. She discussed the implementation of the new Sunday materials. So um, there were a total of 22 students in grades kindergarten through 12th who were part of the field study. This was the first year we had it. So some of those students showed minimal growth and some showed no growth, while others showed more than a year's growth. Um, students who needed the phonics intervention were the ones that benefited the most. Teachers, after doing this for one year, have a better understanding of the screening process and who might need the program and how often it should be. Um, teachers have realized the importance of communicating the results for special ed students, because of course there were some special ed kids in the program. So there will be future spring and fall meetings to meet with the parents to share the results and listen to concerns and feedback from parents. There was also a discussion about how the leveled literacy intervention, intervention and Sunday work together because some students were dual enrolled in both. So it's important to realize that some students need the level literacy intervention and others need Sunday. The assessments are an important piece to determine which fit is best for which students. Um, what one student needs is different from another student's needs. And the district, what we all gather from this, is really taking a more personalized learning approach for these students and figuring out which program will best benefit them, which we all thought was great. The second part of the presentation was um, Dr. Kim Brown, Julie Conrad, Deb Zarling, and Lisa Duxbury discussed the phonics program curriculum adoption that was piloted this year at different schools. So there were two different programs um, that were in schools. One was the Teachers College Reading and Writing Projects Units of Study, and the other was Fontes and Pinnell Phonics, which was an updated version of what we're currently doing. Um, feedback was collected through ongoing surveys, and decisions were made based on student, attestment suits, excuse me, student assessment scores, teacher preferences, and teacher and student engagement. In the end, they chose to go with the teachers, college reading and writing project units of study in phonics. Assessments showed the growth and compared it to benchmarks in several areas. Um, the, let's see, we did voice concern that about 40% of students are still not meeting grade levels for English language arts according to the Wisconsin Forward exam. So the district will continue to look at how pieces are being used and ensure that teachers are aware of available tools and how to use them. Students over the last three years have been coming in at lower assessment points than they were before, meaning our 4K and kindergarten students know less of the alphabet than they did a few years ago. So that gap needs to be closed and is actually getting wider due to the fact that each year's starting point for kindergartens is, like I said, getting lower. There's work being done at the 4K level but it's not universal for every child. Children ages birth to three are requiring more assistance and the district is engaging with other organizations to improve the state of the child and how we are supporting parents with resources to prepare students before they even come to the OASD. And the last piece of this was that empowering professionals to make decisions with confidence and confidence will be an important piece. Student data provides information and the teacher must know each child as an individual to determine what tool will best address that, that data need. Communication to the families as to how a child is progressing and real conversations while supporting hopes and dreams are also important pieces and it's imperative that those conversations be done in a confident way as most tend to back away from communicating such information. Uh, we talked about how a number does not find define the students, um, but it, so it's still part of the conversation that needs to be had. So a suggestion was made to reach out to parents and invite them to the board listening session on June 12th, specifically the parents who have been advocating for stronger phonics in our district. So that was kind of our last part of the meeting. The next meeting is scheduled for August 1st. Thank you, Mrs. Sawaji. Maybe we should just go around the table here. Mr. Evans, do sure. you want to take it away? Absolutely. The Administrator Compensation Committee met on June 6th at 7.30 in the morning. <laughs> uh, the topic of discussion was uh, actually a continuation of Administrative Guideline 3410, Market Analysis for the CPI. A 
uh, Dr. Gundock addressed the committee regarding next steps talked about at the last <coughs> ACC meeting. He shared a spreadsheet with the committee showing salary comparisons of other school districts. He also showed a document with calculated salary range showing where all administrators are within their range. Current ranges have not been updated in a while and that is why staff are below the ranges. It would take approximately $19,000 to get administrators out of the <coughs> negative and get them into the bottom quartile. It was suggested adding columns for other factors such as 10 plus years of longevity, having a doctorate, etc. Um, the spreadsheet does not indicate next steps, but it gives the committee an idea of how the district is doing with regard to administrator salaries, and it provides the superintendent with good information to make a decision going forward. Administrators were asked what type of metrics they would like reviewed to move forward um, in sort of salary ranges. Ms. Pinkston will reach back out to colleagues to get additional information on longevity and metrics. The state is considering changing the accountability system with some type of growth measure for the school report card. Perception data from students, staff, and parents can be used to measure culture. How is risk-taking innovation and those pieces honored to allow moving to the next level? Question. These needs to be a there needs to be a plan to attract and retain high quality candidates, but being respectful of his existing staff. A question is asked of administrators if there is anything they would be interested in besides money, and vacation seemed to be a popular item. There was also a large amount of interest in adding an assistant principal at elementary sites to support the principal. It's also determined that the district needs to start looking at three to four track schools. The community was comfortable with the ranges but wants to bring a systematic approach to this to the strategic plan under human resources. Dr. Gunlock will share the information distributed with all administrators and our next meeting will be to be announced. Thank you very much, Mr. Evans. Mr. Holmstead. Um, I'm reporting from our policy and governance meeting. It was Monday, June 10th. Um, we had five um, different well, we had four, nope, three, <laughs> two. Right here, one. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Right here, one, anyway. <laughs> well, after I looked at him, I was wrong. So the first um, policy we did look at was 7530, which is the lending of district-owned equipment. We changed the wording in there to give the superintendent um, the to approve of lending out our district-owned equipment for summer camps and athletics. Um, it was in there that it had to be board, so we changed it that the superintendent could do that. That's coming um, on June 26th uh, for board approval. Um, the second thing we looked at was the um, legislative committee that we are looking at um, putting in and um, making for us. We had, we all got that big packet um, from um, Dr. Herzog with, from the WASB and everything with all the different um, some other different policies from other districts and um, all of what, you know, some um, information from WASB of what these committees should look like. We went through all of that. There was one in particular in that packet that we really liked, which is the Elmbrook um, and Brookfield, and we kind of maneuvered it around. We took some stuff out, added some stuff. Um, we went through it, you know, all of it, and then we are having a draft brought back to a policy and governance. We're gonna look at that and then in our next meeting in July, and then bring it to the board, bring that, um, look at the draft, make sure we like it, bring it to the board for full approval then and probably in August. Awesome. And then um, at that same meeting, um, Dr. Herzog will then appoint um, and de designate people for that committee. Nice. Um, and then the third thing we looked at was the 2019-2020 employee handbook updates. Um, Mrs. Pinkston provided a summary of the changes being proposed for the 2019-2020 employee handbook. They included the addition of language in the contract section regarding a resignation date being included with a 30-day written notice. There wasn't, they didn't have to put a date, now they do. Um, changes to the funeral leave to remove redundant language. Um, and to be specific about the amount of days allowed. Um, change three was to the retirement benefits, um, the removal of addition lang additional language regarding contributions, because we had made that change. 
Um, and then four, there's a grandfather clause, so we moved a paragraph in there. Um, that is coming also to the board in full on June 26th for our board meeting um, for approval. Um, and then we, what Jim was talking about, we, um, they had asked the committee, the administration, administrator compensation committee had asked to bring that policy to, or it was, um, it was administrative guidelines because that is one that we do have to approve. We brought it to policy and governance. Um, so Dr. Gunlock provided information about the three proposed changes of the guideline, the full market analysis, just like um, Mr. Evans had said, and the salary ranges. Um, the membership dues removing a paragraph, which will allow administrators to budget for multiple organizations, and um, also um, allowance for use of vacation through the month of July, because a lot of our vacation, we do that every mm -hmm. year, so we're going to put it in writing. And then that will also be coming to um, board approval on June 26th. Um, and then the last, we looked at policy 8510, the wellness. Uh, Mrs. Schnorr talked about the updates made to this policy based on the National School Lunch Nutritional Standards and Nutritional Values. Um, there's a committee who periodically reviews the information and one of the new requirements included a three-year review cycle for this policy. The committee discussed um, concerns about sharing tables and the language used in that policy. It will also be coming for board approval on June 26th. And our future meeting is July 11th at 8.30 a.m. on that one. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Olmstead and Mrs. Garner. Yep, I have uh, facilities and finance. We met on May 23rd, um, and we discussed two things. The first was the food service CEP program that is coming down from the feds. Um, and the Michelle Stammen and Randall Bokoff presented a proposal um, to make all meals in the school free through this program. And CEP stands for Community Eligibility Provision. Um, initially, we're going to start with, or like to start with, 12 schools. That's, that's kind of how we're going to ramp this thing up. Um, there is a four-year reimbursement option for eligible school, uh, for schools that are participating. Lunch and breakfast would be served free with no verification. Whether you are reduced or you're free or you don't have money in your account, it does not matter anymore. It wouldn't matter anymore under this program. Um, this would simplify counting and claiming for the district by tracking total reimbursable breakfasts and lunches and applying free and paid claiming percentage. Um, it also avoids judgment. Um, students would have a better concentration, because I asked, so why do we want all kids eating breakfast and the answer is they do better and uh, even kids that have breakfast at home may not eat it there and so if we get everybody eating in school uh, usually kids do better that way eventually the goal would be to have the entire district receive free meals at this point we can't do it so we're gonna start um, oh and it's noted that if we agree to participate in this program it's a four-year mandatory commitment so once we're in we're in for four years now once you're in you can add schools after like during the four-year period but once you start you have to go the whole four years so we were shown four options the option that we're likely to go forward with is starting with the 12 schools 10 are elementary and two are middle and we'll we'll roll it out that way um, they feel that there is enough food service workers to make this work um, in addition to having the food available we also talked about changing the way that kids eat breakfast um, so there was a concern with busing and getting students to school on time to eat. And so um, they've been piloting programs where kids actually eat breakfast in the classroom. And for the schools that have adopted that, it has gone really well. And so helping other schools that may be resistant or reluctant to try that to go to the schools that are doing it and see how well it's worked. Um, yep, there's four schools that do that. Um, and students would also be able to bring their own breakfast if they choose. So they don't have to take the school breakfast. Let's see. So the next steps are they need to apply by mid-June, then we'll throw out a public release. There will be a letter that goes home, or a household notification. Um, in the future, they would like to introduce new ways of breakfast, you know, talking to the different schools and how that would be done. Um, once we have the, two, the 12 schools started, we would like to then add in a middle and a high school and maybe another elementary the next year. Um, there really is no concern that the feds are going to discontinue this program, so that's a good thing to know. Uh, they're currently piloting this breakfast program at Traeger Elementary, and they will be conducting a workshop for us in August or September. 
when families are back. The second thing that we discussed is the OEA post-employment changes. We have these different levels that we've talked about. Um, they came back with, Sue Schnorr shared a spreadsheet of what other schools do regarding post-employment. The range is anywhere from $500 to $1,000. The proposal for us was to change the whole darn thing to 1000 bucks. It would simplify the accounting um, and we can afford it because um, there are certain people that don't claim their post-employment benefits. So like in 2017 and 18, there was $112,000 in forfeitures. So that's the way that we can afford it. Um, this year in 18, 19, there's been $90,000 in forfeitures. So it seemed reasonable at this time to implement the $1,000 flat, um, the flat thousand dollars and then they will continue to monitor to make sure that that's working the way that it is uh, anticipated okay next meeting is scheduled for august 15th thank you, thank you. mrs garner please do uh, All right. Just a quick update uh, for Ms. Gardner, just mm -hmm. to let you know that I did sign off on that application this week for us to submit it to the federal government for that program, just oh, so okay. you know that that has occurred. Awesome. That's great. And for, um, for you, Ms. Salaji, yeah. um, is let you know that we did reach out to our parents uh, for the listening oh, session that um, tonight, and we did have um, a parent that did, did arrive. Oh, so good. We'll, yeah, that was tonight. Yeah. It was. So I just wanted to follow up on both of those, please. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Dr. Perfect. Okay, moving on then to the non-agenda related public forum. We had no one who signed up for that, so we'll move on to the agenda related public forum, forum and no one signed up for that either. So we will move on to workshops. We have three workshops this evening, all dealing with accountability issues. We will begin with the Achievement Gap Reduction, or AGR, with Dr. Brown and others, I believe. And others, yes. So we have Christy Levy joining us tonight from Washington School, Beth Galeazzi from Webster Stanley, and uh, Kristen Burgert from Roosevelt Elementary. And Rhonda, unfortunately, is out of town right now, but I will represent her data tonight. <laughs> so. And I apologize for the children. Don't apologize. No, I just said to <laughs> Please just don't. Said Allison, I want to go switch with Linda. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking the same thing, actually. Yeah. I feel like that's the highlight right yeah, there. I mean, Ash, yeah. Ash North and this, I don't know. Yeah. Right here for the whole meeting. Line. Not to worry, Mrs. Burger. We're here for children. <laughs> All right, so we're talking about the achievement gap reduction schools and the requirements. And so the four schools, we just introduced the principals, but Jefferson, Roosevelt, Washington, and Webster Stanley Elementary. And the requirements that we utilized this last year was a class size reduction of 18 to one and in instructional coaching. Um, another um, piece that we could utilize is tutoring, but we didn't use that this school year. And then the AGR schools all have the same goals. And so for literacy, 85% of students will be reading at or above grade level by the end of the 2018-19 school year, as indicated by the DRA-2. And you can see the DRA benchmarks um, and what we want them to meet by the end of the year. And then the math goal of 80% of students meeting the performance standard in their grade level by the end of the school year, as indicated by the ABMR assessment. <laughs> and you'll notice um, kindergarten, it's forward number word sequence is what we're taking a look <laughs> at, addition and sub subtraction <coughs> for first grade, structuring numbers at second grade, and third place is, or third grade is place value. And that just works developmentally about where, what we can look at for our students. And so I'm going to let uh, each principal share a little bit about some of the strategies that they've been utilizing along with the data. So we broke our strategies down into the building level strategies, which primarily focuses on the work that we do with our staff um, so that we're um, supporting strong instructional practices. And then after this, you'll see what that looks like when it's applied in the classroom with some of our classroom strategies. Um, so we're continuing to analyze past and current practice in terms of expectations and academic accountability for our learners. Um, knowing that we have a lot of growing to do, we want to make sure that we're maintaining that focus on high achievement and that we're not inadvertently lowering expectations while we meet our students' needs. Um, so that's something that we have continued conversation about at our building level. Sorry. Um, we had uh, teacher teams meeting regularly and analyzing student data, not just to look at what the data is telling us in terms of that number, but what is that data telling us in terms of where the skills gaps are for individual students. Um, 
the number tells us something approximate, but mm-hmm. looking further into it tells us really where we need to focus our energy and efforts so that we're moving them forward. Um, this year, uh, for the first year, teachers participated in instructional rounds and peer observations. Uh, so the instructional rounds were opportunities for them to go into a colleague's classroom with an instructional coach who could point things out to them that they were noticing as they were doing those walkthroughs. And then we followed those up by two rounds of peer observations. And so in the first round of peer observations, um, a, a teacher was chosen for the observer um, based on some highlights that we wanted them to see that we would, thought would move them forward as an individual. And then in the second round, they were able to choose a colleague of their choice to go see. Um, and so we talked about you know there being benefits to seeing the grade prior to you or the grade after you or a colleague at your same grade level. And so they were then able to choose somebody that met their needs. Mm-hmm. Um, We also began to investigate and implement the framework of uh, restorative classroom practices Um, and at its core restorative classroom practices just aims to make sure that we maintain a focus on providing high support for students, meaning meeting those social emotional needs, making sure that they feel safe at school, that they're able to manage their upset and frustrations, but that we are also maintaining that high accountability. Um, and the notion that they have to go hand in hand um, or we aren't gonna help kids move forward um, regardless. Um, Our leadership team um, also had instructional coaches meeting weekly to look at student data as a coaching group um, and then also doing their team meetings with teachers um, on a every other week basis uh, where emerging issues were discussed. And then coaches were working in the classrooms to support those teachers so that Um, They were meeting with the teachers, but then also seeing that authentic instructional practice. Uh, So what that looked like at the classroom level then for students, uh, students were participated in guided reading groups uh, where they are uh, grouped together and working on specific skill sets to move them forward. Um, Students participated in book clubs. Uh, We had a district level um, and building level focus on conferring with students, so sitting down next to a child um, and knowing how to lead a conversation so that you can dig deeper into their understanding. Um, And then we have interventions in place for students that are a semester or more behind grade level in literacy and math. Um, For family engagement, we did family nights. Um, We do a fall and a spring school to home night where we bring uh, families in for student showcase. Um, social media family outreach during intervention rounds. Um, We did a much more focused effort this year on bringing families into that uh, process when we were working with students who were behind uh, so that they were getting regular updates and that they were part of that intervention round for that student. Um, And then we also did parent-teacher conferences and then we have lighted schoolhouse at our school and so we were working with our CLC coordinator to make sure that she was aware of what we were doing in the classroom so that her staff could support our students after hours. Um, This data will show you where we ended 2017-18 and how that compares to 2018-19. You can see that in some grade levels there was significant growth and in other grade levels there was not. One of the things that I caution against when looking at this is that we are not necessarily looking at the same group of students. Um, So there are a number of grade levels where we had up to 10 new students join and up to 10 students leave us between the end of 2018 and the end of 2019. Um, So it's more complicated than just looking at did they grow from last year to this year. Um, This shows our data from the beginning of this year to the end of this year and it's consistent in terms of the same group of students. So when you're looking at this graph Um, When we run our AGR data, we are only looking for students that were with us for the entire academic year. um, So that we are looking at students that um, received all of our instructional practices and support. Um, So in kindergarten at the beginning of the year, we don't have data for those incoming kindergartners, so we use our January data. Um, And at that time we had 32% of students reading at grade level. By the end of the year we were at 68. Um, First grade we started at 22% and ended at 71%, Um, second grade was 20% and 64%, and then third grade 33% and 66% in literacy. Um, And then these are our math scores using that same method. Um, 6% of kindergartners were at grade level in January and 55% were at the end of the year. 
zero percent of first grade was at grade level and they ended at 92 percent of all of our first grade students at the end of the year were at grade level can i just ask a question yeah. what is the percentage like if you make a year of growth is that a hundred percent growth if you made a year of growth your all, all of your students would be well not Once, necessarily okay not i'm just trying to understand like what is percentage de it depends on where they're coming in okay so right it's it's not unexpected to see that zero percent of your students would not be at grade level at the beginning of the year because yeah. they're they using before. end of the year benchmarks however that's not necessarily telling us whether or not they were at the end of kindergarten grade level when they started right. first grade right so, so they could have been even farther behind correct okay. so it's an attainment score it's not a growth score okay. all right thank you um, second grade went from 4% to 64%, and then third grade went from 0% to 45%. All right. You'll probably you'll notice a lot of the same strategies, so I won't go into a ton of detail. But um, So at Roosevelt, we use different things within our building collaboration, so analyzing that data um, and making plans for that student growth, so really focusing on the individualized students. So if there's something we need to work on, coming up with a plan with a team for that. Um, having conversations around that student data as a whole school and content levels and grade levels. So um, we really work to bring in our specialists into those conversations around literacy and math for how we can be bringing literacy and math into FIAD music and art. And our specialists um, are always eager to do those different things, whether it's a game or when they're lining up and transitioning, incorporating some of those math strategies. Um, and then creating those action steps to support that student growth as we go. My um, literacy and math support um, coaches, one of them who's here tonight, so thanks for coming, um, they meet with um, each grade level twice a month and they meet together with them. It's something we started last year um, to really um, show that support of the coaching staff with the grade level team, but then to um, embed everything together. So a strategy or something you're doing in math might also work with literacy or mapping out our progressions and looking at a student that might have concerns might be in both areas or just one area. So they meet every other week with that grade level team. Um, that allows for frequent uh, student growth monitoring um, and making that differentiation. Um, then the IST is, and myself, we meet every single week to be working together as our leadership team, working together in the classrooms, the grade level team meetings, um, developing those um, school collaborations, like I mentioned. A cool experience we were able to do this year um, because my IST literacy, Amy Bilo, that's back there, she was part of the conferring lab team that brought that to our um, ISTs in the district and to Kim and Julie and myself, we got to experience going into a conferring lab at a few different schools throughout the year with their work they learned at the Teachers College in New York. Um, and in doing so and having that resource in the building, we were able to do a mini conferring lab within our school. So teachers were teamed up with another grade level, either above or below them, and they went in with my two ISTs and myself and we did that conferring with real students in real time, kind of all sitting around them to model what that conferring might look like and sound like, and then going out and practicing and trying that with a colleague team. So the teachers were very, um, interested in that and it was very well received that now they just want more and more of it so how are we going to do this again so um, that's the plan for next year is how we can do um, and increase that um, to improve our conferring um, and then I guess I talked about that for the moment um, in the classroom same that Christy mentioned the guided reading groups book clubs conferring interventions um, morning meeting and that um, one thing we added this year was some specific goal setting for forward exams so we looked at students that were basic or below basic on the forward exam our current fourth and fifth graders using the previous year's data and um, my ISTs and I divided up the students and had individualized conversations with those students of did you even know what your scores were has anyone ever talked to you about this you know pumping them up we didn't want to add that pressure to them but you are two points away from being proficient you got this what are some strategies you've learned that you think could help you this year and just a lot of them I think all but one student had seen their scores from the previous year when they were mailed home so they were like I had no idea or I can totally do this and so that was really empowering with family engagement, we do our family nights, um, social media presence, our PTO involvement, and parent-teacher conferences. And then we also have lighted schoolhouse, so that incorporates into the extended school day. 
Here's our data, as Christine mentioned, you can see from year to year, but it is not necessarily all the same student. We are pretty transient as well, like Christine mentioned, um, but you can see some growth in certain areas um, and overall as a school. This breaks it down a little bit more. So here's our literacy. So kindergarten from January to the end of the year, they grew by 45%, um, from 46 to 91% proficient. Grade one went from 11% to 62% proficient. Grade two went from 35 to 73. And grade three went from 19 to 69%. And for math, uh, we grew in kindergarten from 6% to 46%. Um, in grade one, 11% to 69%. In grade two, 6% to 61%. In grade three, from 14%. So um, Jefferson has a lot of the same strategies that you've heard about, um, but some of them uh, just to highlight. So the conferring is something that you keep seeing over and over again because we're really working on how can we confer across the curriculum, no matter if it's math, literacy, or science. And uh, social studies will be the next one that we're taking a look at that with. Um, elaboration and craft is something you also will see across all the schools. If you saw their school improvement goals, many of the schools are focusing on that elaboration and craft because it really moves um, kids forward. And then some of the other pieces, um, the mentor techs, of course, we utilize all the time. Um, something that they do is they do the positive student postcards that are mailed home to each family, which of course is a nice social emotional piece. Um, they've done some things with technology, the personal learning ideas, and maximizing Google and Google Classroom. And then, of course, um, the AVMR pieces are some of the, um, the, some of the things that we all do. Uh, but uh, another piece that is important, though, to no note is the special education, regular education teachers coming together to do some planning in order to teach. And here are Jefferson results. Um, you, um, Jefferson has a very transient population, so again, not the same students over time, uh, but this tells the bigger picture. And so you can see in literacy, moving from 11 to 92% with an 81 percentage of growth, grade one, zero to 53%, grade two, 16 to 60%, and grade three, 13 to 83%, so some really nice growth. And then math as well, um, 4 to 73 percent in kindergarten, 0 to 82 percent in first grade. Structuring went from 0 to 28 percent, and place value for grade 3 went from 47 to 79 percent. Um, so at Webster Stanley, we also employ most of the same <laughs> strategies that you have seen. Um, we did do work around our mission statement. We also had Ted Knightsky come in and work with our staff at the beginning of the school year on our mission statement. And um, I know Jefferson School had him too. And then we had him come back two other times throughout the year. Um, and he really kept reminding the teachers and us of our why and why we're here. Um, we've been working on equity and culturally responsive practices. We uh, extended our morning meeting time by 10 minutes this year, which allowed teachers <coughs> to meet the kids' needs when they come in in the morning and their social, just to have them ready for the school day. Um, the other strategies are things that I think you've probably technology integration was one of the other things I'd like to highlight. We worked into the professional development time to highlight a tech strategy that teachers have been using in their classrooms so they would share out, and it only took like five minutes at the beginning of a collaboration, something that they're doing in their classroom so that other teachers would see how it increases student engagement and it can complement the curriculum versus adding something onto it. We worked with our Kiwanis partners and kind of started a food pantry in, in one of, uh, out of our counselor's room. This year it was nice because Webster was able to have a full-time counselor and we could utilize him to help meet student needs again. So I know we've received 
snacks and things that the classroom teachers could give students who didn't have a snack at snack time. And then a couple of the other schools also did different food drives and donated. We were the benefit of some of those food drives. And we worked with our um, community, the Kiwanis partners, to make math take-home games that complemented bridges or maybe the AV, uh, AVMR curriculum. Um, and then the rest of these strategies are things that we, we do district-wide, I'm sure, and we also focus this year on goal setting for the forward exam. Um, our family nights are usually always very well received. Our PBIS carnival at the end of the year is always a huge event that I think the families really look forward to. And. Um, we have started working on really targeting some of our minority subgroups and formed a parent advisory committee. So we're trying to get a lot of their input on what we can do better as a school so that they see themselves in our school. Nice. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, and this is our data. <clears throat> One of the trends, even though it is a different group, I think more just looking down is hopefully we're every year wanting to have more of those kids at the 80% at least proficiency level. And that's something that you can see from both years. So even though we're starting with a different group of kids, it's, it's nice to see that as they do progress through the years, they're becoming proficient. And then this is our literacy progress. And it's the same thing when you look to see, when you're looking down at it to see that um, the percentage of growth should get smaller because hopefully we're starting closer to the target. And here was our progress for math. So, anyone have any questions? I know one of the things on as a side note, um, especially having a higher poverty school, the teachers, the parents, myself, we really appreciate having the class size reduction because it gives us an opportunity to level the playing field and it gives the teachers more time to meet one-on-one. -on -one. Those conferrings can happen more often because they're not having to see 25 kids, they're having to see 18 or less. So it's just, it's, uh, I am thankful that the district is committed to AGR because I think it helps to give us the push we need to make sure that it's equitable for the kids. Any comments or questions from board members? I had one question. With the addition time that you put in the morning um, and then you also put extra time into um, one other spot you put it to the social emotional needs. Mm -hmm. Did you see, do you think that that made a, a significant difference with the students? Just adding that little extra time for the emotional stuff? Yes, I do. Just ha having them not having to feel like we have to come in and right away get down to the curriculum and get down right. to the difficult work, giving them a chance to kind of settle in. Yeah. Um, it's in and having the teachers I think we, we, we focus too they'll do um, social skills lessons that's focused off of our PBIS data so if we okay. see okay we're showing more um, aggression this month is what our referrals are showing then that'll be the data we focus on at our morning meetings and um, we also last year a team of um, teachers wrote lesson plans around culturally responsive books so we also that gave them an opportunity to pick out themes from that that they might be seeing in their classroom and share that with the kids oh, okay. Got it. That's, nice. that's wonderful thank you we have talked a lot this year about celebration and celebration in relationship to student learning and student growth and I always find this uh, report to be very informative and very helpful because we do celebrate the successes of those those children um, through
throughout the year. And two of these schools, Washington and Webster, excuse me, Jefferson and Webster, represented here tonight, were, rep were recognized at the state level as schools of recognition. But I believe all of these schools, at some time or another, have been recognized. And you simply have to walk into the, the, uh, the hallways and you see these beautiful plaques with the outline of the state of Wisconsin to see the schools of recognition or whatever the term was at the time. But uh, I do know, for example, that Webster's collection of those <laughs> schools of recognition go back oh, probably at least 15 years, mm -hmm. if not longer. So there's been a long tradition, a long history of student successes through this program, and we salute all of you and your staff members for making that possible. Thank so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on then, we have an energy conservation report uh, from Mr. Fox, our Director of Buildings and Grounds. Good evening. Good evening. So I'm here tonight uh, dovetailing off a conversation we had at our last energy committee meeting. Uh, we had discussed this benchmarking report that was coming out. It was due to come out in March. Uh, it did not come out in time for our meeting, um, but did come out subsequently uh, just a couple of weeks ago. So I'm here tonight to share that report with you. Uh, it was included as part of your packet. Uh, so I'm here more or less to discuss the findings of that particular report. So it's interesting to note that the first energy efficiency study was conducted in 2006. It's not clear to me if Oshkosh participated in that study or not. It was strictly voluntary, as was this current study. Um, I don't have that information at my fingertips. But that uh, efficiency study that was conducted in 2006 included 1,293 schools um, in 226 school districts. Uh, much like this one, it benchmarked similar schools based on age, size, amenities, and HVAC capabilities. So it was very unique in that it was the first study in the state of Wisconsin ever conducted this way, and it was all schools, and it was only uh, schools comparing themselves to other schools, only available for the schools that did participate in that study. So it was a really nice benchmarking tool to that, until that date, uh, the only benchmarking opportunities we had were really to benchmark ourselves which really isn't a, a good barometer as far as how you're progressing because uh, there's no way to really truly evaluate um, your growth potential at that point. So 13 years have passed since that study. Um, approximately a year and a half ago, Focus on Energy had approached the schools and asked, hey, we want to do this again. We thought it was well received. Uh, many of the schools uh, were able to participate in that study and as indicated in that study approximately 1200 schools did participate uh, there was a little bit of uh, difficulty in pulling the study together at the tail end uh, due to uh, how we purchase energy today uh, with with hedging and, and with bulk buying on the market but uh, ultimately that study was concluded and again like that first study the benchmark is based on size age amenities HVAC capabilities in the schools. So that's important to know so that when you're looking at a, uh, you know, a 50,000 square foot school, that school is being compared to other schools of like size, um, you know, whether or not a school has a pool, whether or not it has, uh, you know, a, a certain gem size. And they try to take into account as best they can how that school is utilized. That's important to note. Um, this particular study is different from the last study in that it included rather than just a score which is a lot of times what we're used to seeing right so when we're uh, when we're in the energy committee or a lot of times when we're comparing our energy usage um, we use one statistic uh, typically an energy star rating which if you re recall that that's something you may have heard when we're looking at a particular school you could have qualified as an energy star rated school and you'll get a plaque and you could post that plaque on the wall this particular study included something new called a B3 benchmarking, Energy Star, and a peer-to-peer -peer comparison. So the B3 benchmark 
uh, something new uh, that used current energy uh, data from the school, that's our actual data, and then it compared it to the energy code. So if we were to build a building like that particular school, about what would we assume that school would consume for energy? So that's really what the B3 benchmark data represents. Uh, B3 peer rating within <coughs> that report um, is ranked from 1 to 100, 50 is average, so 50 is not bad, it's just right down the middle compared to every other school. Uh, your peer rating is just that. That is, the, that is really the, the nuts and bolts of this particular study. It's what we wait to see. It is comparing our 50,000 square foot school to every other 50,000 square foot school across the state of Wisconsin. How do we rank? Are we doing better or worse? It's not overly revealing as to why we're doing better or worse, but again, it's a benchmark, it's a tool, it's a snapshot to tell you how you're doing that particular day with your particular uh, strategies. And then, of course, the energy star score. Again, that's something you're probably more familiar to seeing. Uh, reported and reflected as a number, 1 to 100. 50, again, is average. Um, it is a number more widely used, and it, um, it's more of a national model. They weatherize our data. They compare it with um, national facilities that are of similar size, may or may not be schools. They're just facilities that are consuming energy that are about the same size, but again, there's, there's a, it's a fairly complex formula, but more widely utilized. The nice thing about this particular study is it rolls all three together and really parses that data in, in different segments for, for you to view and, and um, kind of pull away from it what you will. Again, there's a lot of questions, I think, that you can leave the study with, so <coughs> the study is more or less on the surface um, more of a snapshot to glance and, and, and evaluate, if you will, uh, your, your low lows and your high highs mm -hmm. and everything else in the middle, I think you try to understand why. But uh, for your convenience, we, what we tried to do was, I think there was a 28-page report that was part of your board packet. We tried to break uh, the buildings down into similar groups. So here are our support buildings. Uh, one important note, this study, for whatever reason, did not include our maintenance facility and did not include Oak Lawn. Uh, I don't know why, it just got lost. So that information is being given back to Focus on Energy and will be added to a report for, for us to evaluate in the future. Um, I know that the maintenance facility is one of our, one of our poor performing facilities, uh, just given the traffic in and out of that building throughout the winter time. But in our support buildings, um, we have the administration office and the recreation department. You can see, um, again, the B3 benchmark, B3 peer rating and energy score. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on them, but uh, B3 benchmark is, is kind of odd. They reflect it in stars uh, and they shade their stars, which can be difficult to see. It can be a quarter star, half star, or it can be five stars. So less stars is worse, more stars is better. Um, and you can kind of see that carry throughout the B3 peer rating and an energy star score. So if you're low on your benchmark stars or your, um, your uh, kilob uh, KBTU, uh, your kilobytes, um, excuse me, your BTUs, not, not data, uh, your BTU rating, you're gonna see that kind of carry through. The B3 rating is pro peer rating is probably gonna be low. Your energy star score will probably be low. Uh, so we can see the administration office score is fairly low. Um, it's at 43%, 50 being average, so we're below average, and of course that's reflective in the Energy Star score. Um, now I said that you almost need to look at these numbers and take them for what they're worth and understand what's going on within the facility. Uh, our recreation department scores fairly high as far as the Energy Star is concerned, and our peer rating score is fairly high. Uh, however, what we also know about the uh, recreation department is that we don't really have any air exchange within that facility. <laughs> um, we know that most of the radiant heat in that facility is inoperable. So these numbers can look very good, but you have to really understand why maybe they're not great numbers. So in other words, if you took a building and shut the power off or turn the heat way down, it would look very well on a report but it may not actually be performing as well as you think. That's one of those buildings I wanted to point out as part of this report that I think the numbers are truly reflective of a well-operating building. 
Uh, middle schools, again, we put these in order from poorest performing to highest performing. I say that uh, with Webster Stanley as our poorest performing, remember that three on the B3 benchmark and the B3 peer rating, 50%, or 50, I should say, is, is average. So I don't think average is necessarily a bad place to be, particularly with older buildings. Um, I think what you will find throughout this entire study is that with the exception of probably our maintenance facility and um, this facility, our worst score is probably average. I think mm -hmm. for 75% of our buildings, we're well above average, mm -hmm. and I'll explain why. Uh, but Webster Stanley is average, South Park above, uh, Merrill Middle you can see is sitting above average, uh, Traeger you would expect as a, a building within the last 20 years to be above average, Tipler one of our, uh, one of our only buildings that got a 5 uh, and close to 100% on a peer rating sitting at 96. Mm -hmm. uh, we broke elementaries into two different groups, the north side and west side. Uh, again, Washington is at average, just above average on peer rating, sitting at 59. Uh, but all the other schools, Roosevelt, Franklin, Emline, Cook, and Reed, um, all sitting in, you know, above average from 81 to 92 in the, in the peer rating. Oops, a little slow. Uh, Bottom of this chart, Tipler Middle, I apologize for that. That's a typo that does not belong there. We already discussed it. <laughs> but on the west side schools, Oaklawn, excuse me, on the north side, Oaklawn was forgotten. But on the west side schools, again, Oakwood Elementary, everybody on this particular west side is above average. Our worst school being Oakwood Elementary at 3.5 with a 76 peer rating. Uh, Smith at 3.75 stars, 81. Um, Lakeside sitting at 92. Um, it is a little bit older facility, but remember that received a full renovation mm -hmm. and a building addition, so I fully expected that to perform well. Um, Carl Traeger, along with Traeger Middle, Traeger Elementary does fairly well as a newer building. Um, Shapiro surprised me a little bit, but Shapiro has, has just a little bit more HVAC technology invested into it than some of the other facilities did uh, through our Act 32 projects. So, that, that is easily explained. But I, I am intrigued at these buildings that we hit 4.25, 4.5 in the star rating. And once we start to reach the um, middle 80s to 90s to 96, I think that really is a phenomenal score. Mm -hmm. When you're looking at your peer rating, I mean, we're at 95% at Shapiro compared to every other school across the state of Wisconsin that's around that particular size. I think, I think these scores, as you look at the study really speaks volumes mm -hmm. about the investment that you've made in your facilities. Uh, remember that the bulk consumption of energy within our schools is our HVAC equipment and our lighting. Um, closely, you know, really the third highest would be your plug load, which is very difficult to account for. So this is really, this is really identifying and reflecting highly on the monies that we have spent um, through our infrastructure updates. I can't move. Here we go. Uh, I realize this is small. It's not an eye test, but um, uh, again, trying trying to take the data in different ways rather than looking at a report and rather than looking at it the way we just did. I wanted to have one snapshot on an overall spreadsheet. So if you wanted to, you could look at it on your own document uh, and and capture every single school in order uh, from lowest to highest. If if it helps you process the report. A little bit better. Uh, we also included, uh, we, we took this data and we put it into two different visual bar graphs. Uh, this one does reflect all of the data. Uh, I'm not overly um, excited about looking at the, um, the uh, KBU data. Um, it, it does it, it helps me a little bit look at our, our energy consumption, both the benchmark and what we actually consume. I prefer um, to look at this particular chart, the next one, uh, which eliminates yeah. 
the KBU and just focuses strictly on the peer-to-peer -peer rating. It just focuses strictly on uh, Energy Star and, um, and then our B3 benchmark. Again, the B3 benchmark with the stars doesn't reflect well. You know, it's hard to compare five stars against a, a zero to 100. But um, I really, I really like what I really, excuse me, what I really like about this is looking strictly at the, the peer rating in an energy star. I think graphically, when you're looking at the 50th percentile line, you can really see where all of our schools fall within that, within that entire study as compared to other schools across the state of Wisconsin. And again, I think it speaks volumes of our investment um, and where our schools rank as compared to the rest of the state of Wisconsin. The windows at West High School will help. I was just going to ask that. They do. Uh, there, and actually, I wanted to open open the discussion. Um, I had I had a summary slide, but I think what you're going to see is West right now um, is coming in low, mm -hmm. uh, but um, I think you're going to see that number increase. To what extent, I don't know, but we are doing approximately. 85% of the building exterior this summer with glass and yep. with insulation. Really that the, the entire wall, the uniqueness of that structure is that, that most of that exterior is not masonry, it's all just insulative panels and glass. So we're, we're really changing the bulk of that building shell. I think you're going to reflect it not just in the new insulation and the insulated glass, but it's low E glass yep. and it's bronze tone, so it will two, reflect a lot of thermal Two panes. Heat. Correct. Going from from one paint. Uh, from one, yeah. that is correct. So uh, I think you're going to see significant Illegal. increases in our. We're probably going to reflect that more off of a, a one-year trend. Once we look at our energy this time next year, okay. it'd be very interesting to see um, how that did help us. So why? Why are we doing so much better than everybody else in the state of Wisconsin? I, you know, as I had said, these numbers really, really just capture more of a concept. They really don't tell you what we're doing. They don't tell you what everybody else is doing across the state of Wisconsin. But I, I can tell you what we're doing, and I can tell you why I think our schools are performing better than everybody else's schools. Um, Act 32 is a significant contributor. Uh, we invested a lot of money into our brand new boilers, brand new air handlers. Um, we do not run any air compressors for pneumatic air. I can tell you that we're one of the few districts in the state of Wisconsin that does that. Uh, so we eliminated all pneumatic controls. They're inefficient. Air compressors are inefficient. They're energy hogs. Uh, pneumatic controls leak. Airlines leak. Um, a lot of schools with older buildings are still running their ventilation equipment off of time clocks. We're running off of a building automation system, mm -hmm. which was my last point. Um, that building auto automation system is intuitive. Mm -hmm. We tell that building automation system when we want to occupy the building, and it'll automatically calculate inside air temperature, outside air temperature, and it will optimize start times for buildings to start to get the temperature where it needs to be when school is going to start. We we control classroom spaces. We control corridor spaces within two degrees of heating and cooling at all times. We have um, occupancy uh, periods that we control very specifically. You know, a lot of a lot of school systems do not have these, um, or they're not monitored perhaps as well as they should. That's not to say they don't have them, and that this is technology not used across the state of Wisconsin. But I know here in Oshkosh. Um, our HVAC technician, Jesse Wild, does a, a fantastic job, as do our head custodians, about making sure that the air handlers start when they should and stop when they should. And because of their effort, uh, what you're seeing is the results on our peer-to-peer -peer rating today. Lighting conversion is something that has been very quietly going on. We have not done any building-wide conversions to LED, but we have um, done some lighting conversions. All of our parking lots are now operating LED lights. Uh, we don't have any HID high bay, which is the old sodium or different types of inefficient lighting. All of our gymnasiums are at least T5 or T8, which is a fluorescent bulb. Um, some buildings like uh, Washington did receive uh, fluorescent uh, LED lighting as part of the Act 32 projects. 
And a lot of times if we run into certain ceilings, certain spaces, we are converting over to LED. I think that's the, that's the next thing on the horizon, probably as far as energy consumption goes for Oshkosh schools would be to start to pursue LED lighting. Uh, other than that, are there any questions with regard to the study? Jim, just for viewers, could you tell what uh, we know? But could you tell what Act Thirty Two was? So sure. And how if that that what it paid for? You know the windows and right that that came out of that. Money. Act Thirty Two um, was a was an act that um, oh I think it was about 10, 10, or 10 or eleven years ago it began. Uh, we had three phases of Act Thirty Two. It allowed the school system to bond for money that could be utilized. Uh, strictly on energy efficiency measures, so and we were able. From the state, or the state of, well, well, we borrowed. It wasn't um, right, but the the act came from the state or state, right? Okay. State of Wisconsin, yeah. correct. So it was monies that we bonded for locally, that was used specifically for projects that had a payback to them. Uh, we replaced old air handlers, um, primarily. Well, every boiler got replaced. Most every boiler got replaced in the school system. Um, valves got replaced, air, air compressors got replaced, our, our building auto sh automation system got expanded, uh, some roofs got replaced, some windows got replaced, doors, um, all those spot items. But those types of things, I think, again, were well represented in our peer-to-peer -peer study. Absolutely. Thank you. And then that's been recented. Act yes. 32 did sunset. Uh, I believe two years ago. It was right after we began, it, it could have been last year, one or two years ago. Correct. It was the last time we could go up for it, yeah. Correct. So we are completing the windows at West were part of our third Act 32 measure, and uh, that will complete um, our commitment to that last third phase of Act 32. I appreciated the uh, thoroughness of your report and the mm -hmm. ease of understanding the data with the various charts and graphs yeah. and, and so on. Um, I think it's really important and, and it was part of our training that we did recently with Cheryl Stinsky from the Wisconsin Association of School Boards on the key work of school boards, accountability. And oftentimes action is taken by the board on a vote and sometimes it's explained and sometimes it isn't. Uh, but for the board and for the public to know that we are being good stewards of the resources that are given to us so that we are doing what we can to save money and to model that for our students and our families. And it saves the district a lot of money. Um, I just, I think it's so important that we have invested the resources in the way we have done that so that mm -hmm. we try to make these buildings as efficient as possible for the benefit of, of all of us. Um, and so I really, appreciate this report and the thoroughness of it and the ease of, of reading through the various graphs and charts, so thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Or we, uh, sure, thank Mr. you. Mr. Peschel, did you want to say something? Yeah, or? I'm wondering, I was just on the Focus on Energy website mm -hmm. and it looks like the public doesn't have access to that full school benchmarking study. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you might be able to share that with us just as a complimentary material. Yeah, I think uh, what we will likely do is uh, we'll link to this study on our maintenance. Yeah, the slide is, yes. Go ahead, Jim. You're referring to as far as me providing access to the public? I no, I, I guess I'm wanting to, s so just so that I'm asking, hold on. Ah, never mind. Thank you. Found it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, we will likely uh, post this particular study on our maintenance website link to it. Uh, right. So people within the school system or anybody accessing our, our, uh, our highly visited maintenance webpage from oh, the yeah. outside, <laughs> uh, they can link right to it and, and take a look at that. Are there any other questions or comments from the board? That's really good. Ellen Lahr would be proud. Yes, yes. she would be. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Potter. All right, thank Appreciate you for your time. Your, your time and your efforts.
And our third workshop tonight is Community Learning Centers, and in keeping with what seems to be kind of a theme tonight on accountability, uh, we're going to hear about the 21st century learning centers that have been around in our district for some time, uh, serving students in various schools after, after the regular school day. So we have Ms. Conrad and friends. Yes. So, uh, so thank you. It's been a little bit since we've done a, a CLC 21st Century Learning Center report. So I'm Julie Conrad. I'm the Director of Curriculum and Assessment and Extended Learning Days, or our CLC initiative, um, come to, comes underneath my umbrella. I'm Janelle Holstead. I'm the external evaluator for the CLC program. I'm from the uh, University of Wisconsin Green Bay. Um, and I'm also the statewide evaluator for the Department of Public Instruction. So I wear two hats, but tonight I'm here as the local evaluator. And I am Kathy Rolke. I am the um, director for the Community Learning Centers in the Oshkosh Area School District. And I'd just like to take a minute um, to introduce three of our site coordinators that um, were able to be with us tonight. Evan Holnagel, he is from Merrill Elementary. Uh, Donna Shepard, she is from Merrill Middle School. And um, I just might want to add that um, Merrill Elementary and Merrill Middle School did get a grant renewal this year. Mm -hmm. So um, we're going to be carrying on the program. And then Zach Starkey, uh, he is at Webster Elementary. Yes. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. So tonight we are going to talk about what CLC after school programming um, looks like in the Oshkosh Area School District. It has shifted over time. Our current status of our after school funding, our participation and attendance trends, and our evaluation results that we have gotten back from um, monitoring visits as well as our internal um, evaluations. So the purpose of 21st Century Learning Centers way back in the day when Webster Elementary School was our first lighted schoolhouse site 17 years ago. Webster Elementary has gone through three cycles of five year, five year funding and currently we are currently staining Webster L through that. But we have come from that program all the way up to now we're going to have nine CLC sites next school year. So uh, 21st Century Learning Center provides students with academic enrichment opportunities as well as additional activities and they're designed to complement the regular school day and you notice when we were talking with our AGR schools they actually noted that that they're working work we are working together to make sure that we are truly extending the school day so the services that are included are literacy and math support a key one here is academic enrichment community service opportunities because giving back and engaging students in our community is a key one here. Music, art, sports, and all kinds of cultural experiences and activities that do that. A key one here is you're gonna notice it doesn't say homework help. And we're gonna come back to that and discuss that. Centers help parents, and this is where the parent part comes in by providing a safe environment for students when school's not in session, and also offers the literacy and related educational development for families and participants. And we really piggyback and work with our schools to do that together. Allison. Is there any thought to adding the service around social emotional given? Where are you an audience plant? No. Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we will we will absolutely get okay. to that and start talking about what are our what what are we looking like in the future for okay. our CLCs. Well, so. Mm -hmm. so programming, we are at we had 579 students served this school year and you can see the data on that. One thing that we went from um, back in the 2014-15 school year to current, we were not operating every single day of the school year. In the spring of 2015 as a board, you help approve the sustainability funding so that we could be five days a week at our sites. Um, also a little tidbit of information is that with online registration in this, we are currently at 573 students registered for CLCs for next year already. Correct. And that does not include um, Smith merging with Jefferson. That's so great. we're super excited about that. You can see our up to 32,000 added minutes to the regular school day. And our typical day of programming is snack and recess because we know after school they're hungry, right? Mm -hmm. And we need to run around a little bit. Uh, tutoring support, math intervention, literacy, inter social emotional learning, and enrichment, cl uh, enrichment and club time. And so that club yes. time is really choice for students. 
We are very proud of our community-based partners because one thing that we are looking at in our evaluations and supporting our extended learning day is our community-based partners and so this is a list of this year's community partners that have participated with us either in um, our CLC sites or going out for um, experience field trip experiences. And, and I will just add that this list is phenomenal compared to pretty much all of the other CLC <laughs> sites across the state. That's great. Um, Thank you. So okay. it's, it's, it's unbelievable how many partners are involved. So being under um, 21st Century Learning Centers is authorized through Title IV, Title IV Part B within our Every Student Succeeds Act. And so with that, this is, this is federal funds that are administered through the Department of Public Instruction in Wisconsin. And so with that, we are held to very high standards and performance measures. And so for elementary schools, you can see the goals. Um, all of our elementary schools, whether they're under CLC funding or not, we follow these same performance mm -hmm. measures and we are comparing ourselves in constantly striving for those mm -hmm. as well as our middle schools both our middle schools are funded and we're actually adding Webster Middle School this year through this funding um, but these are our um, performance measures and goals and so we're going to talk more about those and how we're doing compared to those Oh, there we go. We just had to turn it. So status after school, we've alluded to this, that um, these are competitive grants, very competitive grants. Um, this school year, um, Kathy and Janelle helped write or co-write our, um, our awarded CLC grants. We submitted six, I believe, mm -hmm. and we were awarded two. But the cycles go through cycles. Cycle one is for first five years, cycle two, the second five years, and then cycle three. So where are we currently with our after school funding in the Oshkosh Area School District? You can see our schools that are in cycle one, cycle two. We currently have no schools in the third cycle. Washington would have been in the third cycle, but we were not awarded a third cycle grant. So, um, and then these are schools that are under um, fund 80, that it will be totally fund 80 funded. And to give you an idea of how competitive, uh, the success rate tends to be between 5 and 10% for any grant. Um, so the fact that two were awarded of the six is, is also is amazing. very impressive. Mm -hmm. So also one of, the, one of the questions as we were looking at Smith and Jefferson is Smith is a very um, active and a new CLC site this past school year. We have been in co uh, contact with the Department of Public Instruction and because our Smith students are merging with Jefferson, we can move the full CLC site and all funding over to Jefferson. Great. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So we are, we are super excited about that. And Kathy, how many students are we planning on serving at Jefferson now? Um, I, I plan on anywhere between 90 and 100 students. Um, the, with Jefferson and Smith being the same size, um, schools before they merged, um, we had 55 students at Smith. And so given that participation, um, I anticipate the same at Jefferson as well. Yes. So we're, ex we're excited about that. Yes, yes. me too. Mm -hmm. So we're often asked, what's the difference between um, CLCs and mm. childcare? Because um, you know, families are saying, I want lighted schoolhouse here, or I want um, melt. How do we do that, and what's the difference? So with our 21st Century Learning Centers, are funded or fund 80 after school programmings, they have a, absolutely have an academic focus, academic enrichment, really looking on the pieces that truly extend the school day. We have our site coordinators that are in the building during the school day so that they can be bridging, um, bridging between day school and after school and forming those relationships with the day school staff to make sure that students are getting the, the boost, the support, and the enrichment that they need and it's connected to the school day. YMCA and our Boys and Girls Club are great partners. They run um, fee-based before and after school programs. So it's truly what people would consider um, child care. They are not district programs or district affiliated. Um, we do, and don't get me wrong, we do talk with them and we, sure. but they're not district programs. Um, they are school age child care sites, so they're licensed. Um, and once again, they are not linked to the school day so they do they do great things but it's not an extension of the school day so when we talk about 
lighted schoolhouse and melt we are looking at how are we adding extra minutes onto the day for that child in a meaningful fun enriching way that's really supported above their learning at school so you can see in the different graphs, these are the percents of population served. And so we really target looking at how do we serve a third, 30% of our school population. And we are meeting that benchmark. And at our middle school level, we uh, Merrill Middle's at 11% and Alps Tipler is at 17%. We're expecting Webster's going to be somewhere in that place. One thing that we're working on with our middle school programs is really increasing that attendance. What's hard with middle school is that students now also have um, sports, mm -hmm. right, to be mm -hmm. to be able to do and other things. And um, middle school operates a little bit different than elementary because they can come and go when they're um, involved yeah, in other things. Yeah, a lot things. of them can just go home. Correct. And don't need child right. care. But yeah. the but the bottom line is, and you're going to see from our parents, is that do we want them just to go home, right. or do or we, do we have that, opportunities yeah. after school for them that they can be engaged in? Right. So there is a lot of we do a lot of work with voice and choice um, as far as what do middle school, what do those teens, preteens want to do mm -hmm. um, for that school day. So Donna could attest to that that we do a lot of talking with our teens about what what do they want. So one thing we're measured on and we need to meet is our average daily attendance, or our frequency of attendance with um, our CLCs. And up here you can see we are, we are absolutely hitting our benchmarks as far as the percent of students that are attending 90 days or more. That would be considered a frequent attender. And once again, middle school starts to drift because that's just the nature of that but our elementary schools we are absolutely meeting our benchmarks the other thing is is that unless children are attending how do we know that those supportive sort of services are working so right and the research really backs that up that the higher the dosage or the more days of after-school attendance the more likely you are going to see changes happening in social emotional areas or academic areas so DPI looks at anything over 30 days but locally, we want to see higher mm -hmm. than 90 days, which, again, is really, really strong data in mm -hmm. this area. Nice. Right. So the next piece is, is that 21st century learning centers can only be at schools with um, free and reduced numbers of 40% or more. And so um, when we look at this, we want, um, we want our students to be participating at a proportional rate if if that may mm -hmm. if that makes sense and this is really we want students to be taking advantage of this program and so you can see within here um, for example Merrill Elementary is exactly proportional that's almost exactly on the dot how many um, free and reduced percentage of free and reduced students are in there and you can see which students we are serving at each of those and I think you guys know aggregate means what's our mm -hmm. like our total right okay. so I have a question though yeah. real quick even if you aren't part of the free and reduced lunch, you can still participate in the Abs program. Abs yes. Absolutely. Yes, it's available Absolutely. to every child at the school. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Correct. That's, a, that's how I understood it. Yeah. I to make sure. Every child at the school and also any private or parochial mm -hmm. or homeschool student that is within that boundary of that school oh. area because it is truly a community program <coughs> and we're, we're required through federal funding to include all students and we do have a few students that do participate with us our private schools are great partners with us and um, actually we just talked with them about participation for next year okay mm -hmm. that is good to know I learned yeah. something new yes <laughs> what about transportation I'm sorry Mm -hmm. Do we, how do we, if a middle, a parochial school wants to do these, do we provide transportation or? So most of our schools are, are walking schools. Okay. So, and it's because, it, and you would participate in the school that's within your, do you know what I'm saying, within right. your, so your boundary home boundaries, boundaries. Yeah. correct, okay. correct. But walking. we. Yep, but we are required, transportation can't be a barrier to participating in CLCs. And so we make sure and we do different things to make sure that students have that transportation. If we need to, if a family or students need to go home, we, we put them in a cab with a infant seat or a, a booster seat to make sure that they get home because we work with our parents on what they need in order to be able to participate. Transportation cannot be a barrier, and that's one thing they right. absolutely monitor us right. for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So here are our CLC participant demographics. Um, this is looking at our students with um, students with disabilities or special needs and our student our English learners and they're participating. And this really reflects even either a rate at which you're seeing within the school or an actual higher rate. One thing that our CLCs really worked on this year 
is being very inclusive of our students with disabilities and our English learners. So um, we are very proud of our numbers of students with disabilities that we are serving at our schools because those numbers haven't always been there. So we've been really working with staff. Um, Kathy's been doing a great job with professional development to make sure that we have practices in place that all of our students can participate in our learning centers. <coughs> So um, this is the demographics when it comes to race and ethnicity um, within each of the schools. Um, and you can see what that looks like and it's basically proportional to what you would see during the school day. So evaluation and outcomes. I'm actually gonna turn this one over to Janelle. So at the midpoint of every year and the end of the year, we look at this data. The, the data that we're sharing with you tonight is not data that we're just putting together for the board report. It's something that Kathy uses with all of the site coordinators to make sure that we're doing a continuous program improvement kind of um, movement. So we look at it at the midpoint at end of the year. Um, in addition to that, as the local um, evaluator, I come to every site every year to provide feedback. Um, and an example of that is um, on, on the screen in front of you so that you can see um, that we basically look at what the research is telling us about what the best practices are for after school and then the extent to which those practices are happening on the ground. And again, that's that continuous loop, uh, feedback loop is provided so that the sites get that feedback, then they use that information and the next time that I come to the visit, we talk about how you did on last time versus how we are doing today. That's also really helpful as there's turnover with the, um, if there's a, a, a change of site coordinator from, you know, the previous time to the current time to kind of talk about, you know, the longevity of the program. And this has been happening since 2012 that I've been doing this um, mm -hmm. before Oshkosh. Um, in addition to this, it's not on here, but um, recently every site um, in Oshkosh has done the WASIP, which is the state self-assessment, and all of them have an action plan in place moving forward looking at that continuous improvement. And so, the, and so one of the key areas that we have added to our self-assessment and to set our goals for next year is the social-emotional learning areas. We really want to expand that within after school, and we really feel like that that's a, a niche area that we can really work on those things um, for, um, for our students. And so you're going to see that reflected in our programming and also within our goals and our measurements next year. And we're excited about that. So one of the pieces here is where we look at academic outcomes. And this has shifted over time. Some of our CLCs, when we first started and we were looking at data, we were looking at homework completion rates, and we were looking at grades in classrooms, et cetera. But what's really hard about our extending our learning day is that you heard from like our AGR schools that all, all of them actually have, a, except for Jefferson and Jefferson Will now, have a lighted schoolhouse match to it. It's which one is really contributing, you know, to the success of the children. But we know when we put this all together, we know that it's being supportive of it. So when we look at academic outcomes, yep, we want to see improved academic outcomes and we want to see growth, but can we say just because you have lighted schoolhouse or melt at your school, we're getting better outcomes? No, but we know there's, we know there's a relationship in sure. being supportive. So as you take a look at this across time, all of our sites have seen improvement in the percentage of students that are either proficient or they've actually improved their scores. So when we look at this for CLCs, we, we really are trying to get students the support that they need and encouraging parents to, to send students there. So to say that th this is the number of students that are proficient, we're actually targeting students and we're offering that support for students that need to to close that gap or to get additional support so that doesn't really tell you how we're progressing so we really wanted to look at how many students are there or actually have improved as well during right. that school year and for many of the sites it's not a first come first serve kind of situation it's a let's talk to the teacher and yes. see who needs to be recruited to come to the after school program so even when you look at the academic outcomes even if you compared it to the rest of the school you're looking at two different groups of students, mm -hmm. one that is needier, that you know has more room to grow than overall. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's it, as Julie was saying, it's really part of the bigger picture and package mm -hmm. of what we're providing the students. So a key, but a key area is students and parents aren't going to come unless they're having positive experiences. So through our evaluation process, we survey staff, we survey our parents, 
and we talked to our kids about how their experience at after school is going. So we picked out some, we lifted some key information from our surveys that also reflect um, those measurements or those goals that you saw on a previous slide. So one of the questions that's asked of students is, because of the after school program, I know there are at least two adults I can contact when I need help or support. And so here from elementary school, you can see what students, what percentage of students are saying, yep, I have, I have that support. And this particular item would be for the third grade and up. Mm -hmm. um, for middle school, here's the uh, students' positive perceptions mm -hmm. of the program, and you can see the things that they're asked as far as, um, you know, what their positive perceptions are of MELT or their after school program. What's going to be interesting is their parents have a little bit different, middle schoolers have a different perception <laughs> than. They um, still strong. Yes. 80%. That's yeah. so yeah. good. Yeah. Um, but I believe, par I think parents are next. If I can. Yes, yes. they are. Yeah. Yes. Parent positive perceptions of programs. So um, you can see the difference between elementary and middle school. So I believe some of it was right around in the 80% area or 70% mm -hmm. that middle schoolers were saying, this isn't, this isn't, I don't know if this is helping me or not, but our parents really have a strong um, perception of, of what's going on at, at after school for our kids, which is awesome. And so here are some of the things that our parents are saying, and this is lifted right out of the survey that our parents did. Um, the other thing is you could see the, the total number of how many parents like responded to different things. Yeah. Um, we That's had a high. very nice return rate um, with our surveys, so we feel pretty confident that we're getting the feedback that we're looking for. So. Um, parent engagement. This is a key one, and this is really where our after school and our day school really work together. Um, you can see how many family members participated. You have examples here. Um, once again, our lighted schoolhouse and our melt really work together with our day schools, with their school staff to um, partner with that. And you can see which ones were CLC only events and then which ones were actually combined events. So every single, every mm -hmm. um, except for Merrill L had at least one combined, uh, one combined activity. Yes. So it's pretty nice. Um, teacher perceptions, and so um, this is one where we have a little bit of mismatch because right now we're not measuring homework completion, but our staff survey from DPI still asks them about homework completion, so we're not sure. It's a federal that. requirement. Mm -hmm. Every CLC across the United States has to do a three-item teacher survey that includes homework completion. It's just an example how the it doesn't match. <laughs> it doesn't Sometimes match but what you're required to do. Yeah, but we but we're at we're asked that so um, but um, the teacher perceptions as far as have students improved or did they not need to improve in those particular behaviors? So we're connecting with our teachers on those. So summaries and conclusions. So first off, you can see from our parents' pieces, talking with all this, there is a strong need for this program, and it's evidenced by our frequent attendance of program participants. If we didn't need it or they weren't getting what they need, our, our attendance wouldn't be where it's, um, where it's at. So there's definitely a strong need for the program. Our program serves at-risk populations, um, and so we really are getting the students that we are looking to support into, um, into the program. Students and parents perceive the program quite positively. We always have room to improve, um, but we are, we are pleased with the trajectory that we're on. And then teachers perceive the program to improve classroom participation and school day um, behavior. They, they see the link as well. So from there, we need, to talk, we need to talk about sustainability. And back in, once again, the spring of 2015, um, we presented to the board a sustainability plan. And so um, we have two additional grants. Um, we awarded grants. We wrote six, but we got two. And so um, we had different scenarios that we had presented to the facilities and finance of how, how are we going to do this. So six out of the nine CLC sites are grant funded coming up for next year. Um, three sites um, we are proposing are going to be funded fully out of Fund 80. Um, the plan for funding was presented to facilities and finance and also an exhibit I believe you had in your board packet and the packet you had a, a spreadsheet of where the, um, the dollars and what we are looking at for funding. 
um, as sites, as sites age out, in other words, they're aging out of the cycles of funding. So like, for example, Webster Elementary School, we can never go back for another, the way it's currently written, we can't go back for grant funding. Washington, we're not gonna be able to go back for grant funding. Um, and e cook we cannot go back for grant funding so they've been aged out so to speak or we're out of the cycle so we really need to think about in our proposal is there of how we are going to continue that mm -hmm. and how we're going to invest to ensure that quality programming and students and families as you can see in this have come to rely on CLC programming and may not have access to other academic enriching programs since we put CLC's into place um, lighted schoolhouse into place into certain schools our participation rate has definitely gone up um, over time compared to the fee-based programs and so we do want that so you can see where the impact is on that so um, questions? Any comments or questions from the board I just have one overall comment thank you so much thank you for coming tonight and giving us this fabulous presentation and I know this was a long meeting and <laughs> my favorite meeting that we've had in a few weeks so I really I really appreciate all the information and just thank you this is a great program for our kids thank you. anyone else I have a question about the sustainability piece and mm -hmm. um, this is just I'm curious so it's not income there's not a fee based on income need moving forward I mean like at eCook how we said they phased out is is it even a possibility to charge parents who could afford it? Um, actually, we do. Oh, if okay. you if you look on the, um, the the draft budget for students that are late at, or are CLC grant funded sites, elementary students are charged one hundred and twenty five dollars. Families are charged one hundred and twenty five dollars per student. Non grant funded sites, it's two hundred and fifty per year. And, and then for middle school, it's eighty dollars. Is that every family, though, regardless every of income? Every family. However, though, um, for grant-funded sites, it cannot be a barrier, and we, it cannot be a okay. barrier to participation. And so, we do have like a sliding scale, scholarshiping. We work with we work with families mm -hmm. um, on on okay. that. Um, but it can't for our CLC grant-funded sites. It cannot be a barrier. It cannot be a barrier to access. And so, and we take that. We also use that for other CLC sites as well. Okay. When um, in another piece, I forgot to add that our lighted schoolhouse and our um, melt sites, we are partnered with the YMCA and the Boys and Girls Club, and they have been wonderful partners with us as we've gone through um, gone through this endeavor. So um, yeah, they help as well when Some it comes that. to scholarshiping. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments from the board? This, this report uh, to me speaks very loudly to our current strategic plan and the emphasis placed on equity mm -hmm. to provide opportunities for, for all children. And um, so I, I really appreciate, appreciate all the data that were shared tonight, not only on attendance, but also on the um, comments by the, the families and the students about the safety and the caring concern that they feel from these staff members as well as the impact on student learning. So I, I commend you for gathering all this and presenting, <laughs> presenting this here tonight. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? If I could make one more comment, uh, we just need to remember that all of these wonderful things is because of our CLC site coordinators, mm -hmm. our classroom facilitator, facilitators who are mostly um, college students or high school students that come in every day and work with our students and it's because of our staff that work directly with them that we're getting these fabulous results. So um, thank you to them and we are so appreciative Absolutely. that they've chosen to um, work with us. Yeah, very good. And thank if you. I could also just add that CLC is a grant that requires a certain level of sustainability and commitment from the districts and to commend all of you for doing that with the three sites currently that are funded through Fund 80 and knowing that, you know, th that that is part of the grant and that that is, that is applaudable. So, mm -hmm. wonderful job. Thank you very much, all three of you, for your contributions. Thank you. Okay, <coughs> moving on then, we have the consent resolution agenda. Um, 
For the consent agenda, the board has been furnished with background materials on each item or has discussed it at a previous meeting. These will be acted on with one vote without discussion. If a board member wants to discuss any item, it, we, it will be pulled out of the consent agenda and will be voted on separately. Uh, we are pulling one B tonight. Are there any others that anyone wishes to pull tonight? Okay, then the board, be it resolved, this is 1A. Oh, I guess I don't need to read those, do I? Okay, resolution uh, 1A, be it resolved that the Oshkosh Area School District Board of Education approve the appointments, resignation, and salaries as filed with the secretary to the Board of Education. So moved. And resolution, this is a consent. Sorry. So, sorry, I that's okay. <laughs> In resolution number two, be resolved that the Oshkosh Area School District Board of Education approve a new district mission statement, vision statement, core values and guiding principle as listed below. Vision statement, we will be the leader in education through innovation while focusing on the whole child. Mission statement, we will enrich our community by supporting our students to lead creative and empowered lives. Core values, engage students and staff. Integrity, honesty and respect and finances. Excellence, create, creative, visionary learning. Responsive improvement, rigorous, innovation, rapid. Safe learning and working environment. Collaborative culture. Guiding principle, students first, as filed with the secretary to the Board of Education. Now it's so moved. <laughs> Second. Second. Please call the roll. Special. Aye. Special I. Salaji. Aye. Salaji I. Carlin. Aye. Carlin I. Evans. Aye. Evans I. Garner. Aye. Garner I. Rosati. Aye. Rosak I. Olmsted. Aye. Olmsted I. Olmsted Perry. Thank you very much. Resolution 1B, be it resolved that the Oshkosh Area School District Board of Education approve the retirements as filed with the Secretary to the Board of Education. So moved. Second. Once again, we have a number of long-time and dedicated <laughs> staff members who are choosing to enter a new age and stage in life, and it, I think it's appropriate for us to thank them for their contributions to the success of our students and families of this district and to wish them well in retirement. They include Beth Dempsey, who's retiring as a science teacher from Oshkosh West High School, uh, having served this district for 30 years. Hmm. Susan Fowski, a media assistant from Perry Tipler Middle School, who has been with the district since 2000. Gail Fry, a cook from Oshkosh North High School, who has been with the district since 1984. Hmm. <laughs> Gloria Hansen, a cross-categorical teacher assistant from Washington Elementary School who's been with the district since 2000. Margaret Musha, cross-categorical teacher assistant from Oaklawn Elementary School who has served students here since 2001. <coughs> John Tyson, a literacy resource teacher from Merrill Elementary School who's been with the district since 1985. And Teresa Vachtweidel, cross-categorical teacher assistant from Reed Elementary School who's been with the district since 1986. And finally, James Wilford, fifth grade teacher, Reed Elementary School since 1984. He has faithfully served students on the, I think it's the second floor at Reed Elementary. Jeez. So we wish all of these people the very best in retirement and um, hope that maybe some of them will come back and actually serve as substitute teachers for us <laughs> and help out that pool. Any other comments or questions? Yeah, just as a little side note, uh, when Jim Wilford was 35 years younger, he walked into Reed Elementary School, and my mother was one of the experienced, as a nice way to put it, one of the more experienced teachers at Reed, and they actually got to work together for a couple of years before my mother retired. Uh -huh. So uh, cool. he always would ask me about her if I, when I ran into him. So best luck to him and the rest of our retirees. And Dr. Herzog, I'm always so glad that you pull this and we celebrate these teachers because when you look and see that we've had people that have been here since 1984 and longer, we're doing something right. That's awesome. We're really fantastic. So thank you for doing that. You're very welcome. We are blessed to have so many people who are so dedicated mm -hmm. to the students and families of this community. Please call the roll. Salaji. Aye. Salaji, aye. Carolyn. Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any individually considered resolutions this evening? 
seeing none, do we have a request for future agenda items? This um, I'm kind of interested in what came about of the policy 5722 and administrative guidelines 5722. That's the production and publication items that the policy and governance was talking about. Dr. Carter? Uh, we're actually, we went through, we were to go forward and propose a language in front of um, one of the teachers who was unable to make the policy meeting. So we have done that at this point in time and are preparing to bring that um, before the board at the next board meeting. Okay. Any other requests for future agenda? Seeing none, move on to announcements. Does anyone have any announcements? I just want to apologize to Mrs. Kiffmeyer, the principal at Oshkosh North High School, who's been a strong supporter of all student activities, and including the uh, championship girls softball team. I forgot to recognize her earlier in the evening, so mm -hmm. I apologize for that. Um, with that, then, we can adjourn to executive <coughs> session. I would entertain a motion to move to executive session for one, considering the disciplinary data of specific persons under Wisconsin Statute 19.85, paren 1, paren F, A, review expulsion recommendation from expulsion hearing officer for a high school student who engaged in conduct constituting, constituting repeated refusal or neglect to obey the rules under Wisconsin Statute 120.13, paren 1, paren C, paren E, and B, review expulsion recommendation from expulsion hearing officer for a high school student who engaged in conduct constituting repeated refusal <laughs> or neglect to obey the rules under Wisconsin Statute 120.13, paren 1, paren C, paren E. So moved. Second. Please call the roll. Carlin, aye. Carlin, aye. Evans. Aye. Evans, aye. Garner. Aye. Garner, aye. Herzog. Aye. Herzog, aye. Olmsted. Aye. Olmsted, aye. Peschel. Aye. Peschel, aye. Salagi. Aye. Salagi, aye. Aye. Perry. Thank you very much. We are adjourned.